Well, thank you, Dr. Solomon, for coming and having a little chat with us at the end of your talk today. You mentioned at the end uh, people accessing their healing portal mm -hmm. and how that can, uh, you know, different people can have different accesses. You know, uh, would, you, would you like to sort of expand mm. in your experience? I mean, this is, this is purely from my clinical experience that, that sometimes it feels like the, the sort of origin of the problem is at a very psychological level or maybe a, a childhood experience levels. Other times it, it, are, it is just unhealthy patterns that they've fallen into. Other times um, it feels like um, there's an experience that they need to have that, that feels like it's, it's waiting to come out of them. So it, I sometimes feel that just giving the system a little, a little nudge on to the next stage in whatever way you can do. And I think sometimes a dramatic change, whatever that is, so it could be a relocation, it could be a new job, it could be uh, an, a fairly sort of comprehensive dietary overhaul, can sometimes be what it takes. And it, often it's also, in my experience, a meeting with a complementary therapist who can actually make some sense of something in a different way than they'd had um, made before, but, um, or, or the non-specific effects of a kind of, of a meeting that really made a difference to somebody. So that's what I meant by that. And I think it, Sometimes I feel that it's whoever they happen to meet at that time that they were ready for change is is the way that then it, then it sort of falls out and that determines the next few stages. Yeah, when I work with people, I try and encourage them to get very much in touch with their own intuition so they can have a sense of, of what it is that they need to do and follow because you can't obviously do everything that's on, on offer really and, and getting in touch with that seems to... Yes. Yeah access that portal really. Absolutely, and I think sometimes helping people to come back to the joy in their lives gives them an important clue as to which way that, which way they might need to go. And sometimes it comes out in, a, in an image, even that they, they hadn't got the words for before, or that they, you know, they haven't experienced or noticed something. We often um, do a mindful walk in the garden and encourage people to just you know, notice something that, that, that um, grabs their attention and sometimes that can be a focus for, for that sort of thing as well. Excellent. I think that's very important because, you know, people come in and they can think that they have to do this and they have to do that and they have to do the other and actually it's about accessing this, this, this shift, this almost paradigm shift mm. in, in consciousness or, or, or some relationship that they have to, to themselves or life that's, that's actually needed rather than the necessity of doing everything. And they sometimes have to work that one out themselves as well because you know it does seem that you can say that to somebody but if they're if they feel that the answer's over there somewhere that they've got to find it then sometimes you know they it, it's hard to it's hard to help them look at the bigger picture but but you know often then that is what that's what they come around to very complicated and intricate it unweaving is. that has to be well, done, isn't it? It's the, it's the delight, it's the art of medicine, and it really yeah. is that creative art. You know, we talk about the creative arts as if they were something separate, but I think medicine, um, when, when practiced sort of at its best, can be a really creative art. I wanted to get sl slightly critical, not critical, but interested, really. Uh, you talk about a whole body response, mm -hmm. really. Um, and uh, Professor Thomas was talking about you know, all the natural substances that he's proved mm -hmm. and, and considers you know, maybe appropriate. I think to me is the body's uh, natural physiological function. Uh, my sense is that we have what I call fundamental prerequisites to correct physiological, immunological and endocrinological functioning, mm -hmm. which is a lot of long words. But the sense of these fundamental prerequisites, that if they're in place physiologically, that uh, supports the correct physiological function of the body. And for some reason, in my entire time at medical school, they forgot to cover that subject. <laughs> um, you know, and I've been looking at iodine and magnesium and pH and vitamin D and vitamin mm. K and iron and B, you know, B12, zinc and selenium and krill oil and omega oils. And, you know, you start to build up quite a, quite a long list of things. Um, how, how do you work with that aspect of it at, at Bristol, because it, uh, you know, it's turned that, which we sort of intuitively agree is perhaps correct, into evidence-based medicine mm. that you can present to people um, in, in a way that integrates with the oncology department, for example. Uh, you know, how is that? Uh, it's, it's a good one, and it's not my area of, of real expertise, and I suspect that it's made more complicated by 
the normal range is being so individual in a sense, and we're given a kind of wide-ish normal range, but we know that there are some people who fall outside that and that's normal for them. So how do you know when to treat and what to treat and what's the most important thing, but then we'll set everything else correct or, you know, are you, are you going to intervene upstream when actually, so why would this person be deficient in this, you know, is it something further downstream that's causing the problem? So I'm not... Uh, we don't generally recommend that people go off for detailed nutritional testing, mainly because, as far as I understand it, it's expensive and it's not always completely accurate um, in terms of what then needs to be done. So we tend to encourage people to, to sort of shore up their bases by using variety, colour, moderation, and, um, and cutting out some of the things that we know really stress the system, whether that's a physical, emotional, um, or, or sort of psychological stress of the system, or whether it's a toxin that they're ingesting or exposed to so it, it's an interesting one and I think I think that again it comes back down to the individuality individuality of people that some people seem to be able to tolerate quite high levels of disturbance at one level and still be healthy yeah. whereas a small level of disturbance in another of their domains then rocks the whole system so I'm, I'm fascinated by building people's resilience and I do think that being resilient in a number of areas then can kind of compensate for some deficiencies in other areas, I don't know whether you'd agree with that. Would yes, I? I think I think that's so. The body is very adaptable, really. And it's uh, a constant. Yeah, but for me, there are fundamental deficiencies. Mm. Iodine, World Health Organization iodine deficiency mm. report categorically states ninety-five percent of people in the Western world that are iodine deficient compared with the Japanese. Uh, we don't offer that to pregnant mothers. Mm. We know that iodine deficiency causes cretinism, mental retardation. And we know our levels are 50 times lower than the Japanese, but we don't do anything about it. Why, why is that? Do we, have 50, do we have sort of 50 times the incidence of those problems that, that they do? I have half the incidence of breast cancer, yeah. they have half our neonatal mortality rate, which is an index of the health of the nation, not just... But cretinism, or do you think... Do you oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, much but less. They have a five-point higher IQ on average. So. But you know, iodine yeah. is what the thyroid uses to yeah. make the thyroid hormone out of. You can't make it yeah. out of anything else. The, the, the thyroid is the engine of our immune system, and we're deficient in its major fuel. And it is interesting, isn't it? Because I, I mean, the response to the vitamin D sort of epidemic, the vitamin D deficiency epidemic, is very interesting. With PCTs telling GPs not to retest, um, you know, and the, wondering whether to redefine what's normal, you know, the normal levels and things. So I think we are. You know, we like fancier, higher tech answers to things and interventions as doctors. Do you think we're seduced by the science? I don't know. Uh, why, <laughs> why, is it that we, why is it that we don't cover the basics? And I think, yeah, I mean, my, my beef is just how little we talk about nutrition full stop. And it's yeah. only in terms of biochemical pathways and nothing more practical. Um, yeah. and even, even now, 30 years after I've finished medical school, it's still exactly the same that actually the... the it's all macronutrient focused, not much micronutrient learning, and, and yeah. it's complex. I mean, no doubt about it, and it's hard to draw very black and white answers with it. I think that the healthy eating guidelines that we that we generally promote tend to be a kind of alkalinizing um, diet, and that the things that we generally say eat in moderation tend to be the sorts of things that that are more acid forming foods. So, I personally don't, you know, don't feel that for most people who's, who are happy to eat well and support themselves in other ways that it's necessary to, to, um, to add extra bicarbonate, but we certainly would be helping them move towards a more plant-based whole food. We don't do any tests and we don't prescribe any medicines at Kenbron, more because we see ourselves as the kind of bringer together off approaches. So we might help people interpret test results if they come to us with a test result that they're confused by whether that's a conventional test or something that they've um, organised themselves. And we're not set up to collect any sort of physical samples, which is interesting. I mean, we're thinking about um, doing some ba more basic science research in collaboration with the University of Bristol, and it might be that we do end up, you know, helping track people's urinary prostaglandins or, or cortisol responses or something like that. So that will be something new for us, but we don't use personally any biochemical measures as, as an indication of, of sort of um, well-being or progress. We will generally encourage people to go and have their vitamin D levels checked okay. by their GP yeah. um, and then enter into some correspondence with the GP if we feel that they're not being replaced um, as, as indicated by the test.